Right. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, and this is a forum on creation, evolution, and the Bible, how to have a meaningful discussion. This is a forum that we have here at Multnomah Biblical Seminary with the grant that we've received from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And it's part of a science grant initiative uh, bound up with Church and Science Partners for the Common Good events. And I'm joined here by Professor Michael Gurney, who is a professor of theology and philosophy at Multnomah University. Rebecca Josberger, a professor of Hebrew and Bible here at the university and seminary. Derek Peterson, who's the Administrative Coordinator at New Wine, New Wineskins, and also a graduate of the College and Seminary. Sarah Gull, Professor of uh, Biology here at the University, Head of the Department, and also Mark Nicholas, a pastor at Beaverton Foursquare, graduate of the Seminary, and also uh, someone who teaches here as well. And uh, New Wine, New Wineskins has been doing a series of forums related to the theme of Church and Science, Partners for the Common Good. And this is our last one for this particular science grant. Actually, it's been the hardest forum to put together, and it has nothing to do with the subject of creation, <laughs> evolution, and the Bible, but all of us gathered here around this table. That being said, Dr. Josperger. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Genesis 1 and 2 should serve to center our discussion on creation and evolution. But these biblical accounts should also open the conversation. From your vantage point, how would Genesis 1 and 2 function to center our conversations regarding creation and evolution? Well, the first thing I want to say is that anything we talk about in terms of Genesis 1 and 2 and the creation-evolution discussion must be done with a deep, deep sense of humility. Um, it's a controversial and difficult topic in our climate and in our times. Um, and I do agree with the question that this is a starting point, but I think that what we'll find is that we're going to get to a different ending point than we expect. Um, so let me, let me first say that it takes me probably a week or two of classes to unpack this for students. And here I'm going to try and answer this question in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to have to be really concise and everything I say will be... Um, probably a tiny bit oversimplified, but I think we'll get the point across. The, when we ask our questions about creation, evolution, those kinds of things, we're talking about origins, and we're asking how did everything happen? And we're bringing modern questions and concerns to a biblical text that frankly had different questions and concerns. I think, um, and when I refer to the author of Genesis, I'm going to just conveniently do that as Moses. I know that's an entirely different debate, but for convenience sake, I'll either speak of the author or of Moses. But I think we all agree and understand that Moses' time, um, they really weren't concerned with the question of evolution. It may not have been on their radar, likely was not on their radar at all. They are also asking a question of how things began. But one question, how did something begin, can be answered in two different ways, with two entirely different purposes. For the sake of analogy, let me give, um, I don't know if it'll work, but a metaphor I thought up this morning. If someone wants to know what my classes are like, they could go to the Montloma webpage and look up my bio to find out who I am, what I'm passionate about, what I believe, what my philosophy of teaching is, and they'd know about me. But if they wanted to know what my class was like and they're thinking in terms of what assignments are due and they're trying to use my bio as a syllabus, they're not going to have the answer to the question they're asking. Likewise, if they go look at my syllabus, they're going to have a very good idea of what my class is like, but it lacks a lot of personality. They're not necessarily going to know uh, what the philosophy of the professor is or how um, I teach things. Um, and a lot of that is the same thing that happens when we come to the text. We come to the text asking, because it's our modern question, how did the world come into being? And we're looking for some kind of scientific explanation of how it came into being, because that's the paradigm that we bring to the text. So we're looking, in essence, for the syllabus, the, the facts, the sequence of events, the cause and the effect. We know from the ancient Near Eastern world that when they discussed origins, they also talked about how it came into being, 
but when they answered the question how, they were trying to explain how did God or whatever deity they were attributing to creation to relate and interact with his creation. Was creation a product of um, warfare between the gods? Was humanity created in order to serve? Was the world run by chaos? Um, why did things not seem to make perfect sense? What is the cause and the effect? And when the author of Genesis comes in, he's not introducing the world. He's introducing the world to God. So his answers of how um, reflect a lot of things that are going on in the ancient Near Eastern world at that time. For example, when he spoke, that indicates an amazing amount of power. Um, and again, I don't want to get into the incredible interpretations and differences of interpretations here because we don't have time, but what I want people to understand is that there's a different question that the text frames, and we need to take our questions that are valid and submit them to the questions that the text is trying to address. And what happens is beautiful because the analogy again with the syllabus, my syllabus is an accurate description of the class and how it's run. And I would compare here, maybe it's an inadequate comparison, but I would compare the questions to the exploration of science, the cause and effect, what happened. And it's okay if someone comes to it and says, you know, I really think this happened in six days. Or if someone comes and says, I really think this happened, go ahead, go ahead ask those questions, but let science answer them according to scientific method. Be open to the dialogue, be humble about what you bring. I think, and I say this with unbelievable humility because I'm not a scientist, I think where science may overstep a bit is when it starts to talk about the agent of origin instead of the manner of origin. Um, science can answer the questions frequently. I don't think they're sufficiently answered. I think we'll see change over time and, and that's the beauty of science. Likewise, when you go to theology or a theologian or biblical studies or just a Christian who loves Genesis 1 and 2 because it tells us about God, we don't want to force it to answer, in my analogy, the questions of syllabus. When is the test due? That's not what my bio gives. This is God's bio of his interaction with the world. And um, again, you can have incredible dialogue that does not need to be in conflict. And here's where it gets a little bit controversial, especially for believers, because I think believers are pretty clear that Christ, or, or sorry, that God is uh, the author of creation. He's the one who um, made everything. That's clear. We're not debating that. But when we, when we try to make Genesis 1 and 2 tell how he did it, and I know that's where people get a little bit prickly. I understand that. But I believe we're forcing a question on Moses or on the author or on the text that wasn't intended. And we, when we recognize that, and we talk about the text more as in terms of the agent or what that means for the relationship of God with his creation and have a theological discussion about it, not only will our experience on the text be so much richer just imagine if you're reading a text trying to find out about the world and the whole text is trying to tell you about God. You're going to miss the best part. But not only does it create a richer experience, it allows for conversation, beautiful conversation, to go on between scientists and theologians because they both recognize which part of the question they're addressing and those questions are complementary to one another. So very briefly then, uh, Dr. Josperger, when you have a conversation, maybe even in church, mm -hmm. this is about church and science, partners for the common good, how would you open that conversation, focusing uh, the conversation on God as the agent of the creation account, and then allow for people with different views to talk about their perspectives on the medium of that being the how that comes about. So how would you open that conversation? How would I open that conversation? As a what I scholar? what I do, and I don't <coughs> always do it in church context, but typically in the classroom, is I acknowledge that there are differences between opinions on creation and evolution, and then I ask them to set those aside just for a moment, and read the biblical text. I actually do an exercise where I have students um, listen to Genesis one, 
and draw what they hear. And inevitably, students, usually all of them, will import something into their drawing that they didn't hear in the text. Either the world will be round, or the sun will be at the center, or Adam and Eve will be wearing fig leaves. There'll be something in the text that's not in Genesis 1, and that's okay. But what I show them is, look, you can't read this text in a vacuum. You're importing something into it. In the very same way, the text was written not in a vacuum, but with its own ideas. And if we have preconceived notions when we come to the text, a background, a common um, body of understanding that we're reading, isn't it also likely that the author would have as well? And are we willing to find out what that is and try to figure out what the author was telling us? And when we get to that, I've said this before, we find that Moses is not introducing us to the world. He's introducing the world to God. And then by the end of the discussions, the questions on Genesis 1 and 2 are entirely different. There are no longer discussions on creation evolution because the two aren't in conflict with one nor more. That's not what the text is telling us. Thank you, Dr. Jasper. Dr. Gurney, many Christians in our evangelical circles maintain that the historic position of the church on creation and evolution is young earth creationism. How would you respond to that historical and theological perspective? And then I'll come to some other questions sure. after that. Yeah. I mean, well, it's certainly true that there is a long history uh, and tradition of wanting to take Genesis 1 and 2 fairly literally. Uh, I think from early on, there were questions about whether you could do that. And, and just to give an example, I think it's very illustrative of this. And, it, and I think this piggybacks off of Dr. Josberger's point. Uh, Augusta, you know, who's a very influential church father, uh, tried at least five times to write a literal commentary on Genesis. Mm. And, uh, and he became, became a source of frustration uh, because he found it difficult in, uh, to make sense. Uh, you know, just to give a couple examples, one of the things he wrestles with is, um, you know, how, how can we talk about these ordinary days, the days of Genesis, the six days, these ordinary days, when we don't even have the sun and the moon until the fourth day? Um, or what do we do with the, uh, you know, more of a theological point? Uh, what does it mean to say that God rested? If we take that literally, does that mean God's taking a nap? You know, and so clearly uh, Augustine and, and pretty much all the church fathers, I think for the most part, even those who try to take it literally, and Augustine's trying to do that, it, there's, there's problems that it creates. And so uh, I think there's a recognition that, um, and of course by this time there's a lot of discussions about allegory, the role of allegory. And so I think that, that what we see here is a very mixed picture uh, with Augustine, for example, on the one hand, he, he in his City of God, says uh, that the earth must be at least, you know, must be 6,000 years old. It, it, it's no older than that. But on the other hand, he's very critical of trying to take it literally. And this is even before the whole issue of evolution comes up. This is just a matter of trying to deal with the biblical text and to make sense of it in light of questions and issues of that day. So this really, I think, is a reflection of, of Dr. Josperger's uh, salient point that we bring certain assumptions, certain questions to the text. And to bring those questions and those assumptions isn't, I mean, we all do it. It's not a bad thing. And, and, and we want, we should seek answers. I think the church has long held that the story of Genesis, and then particularly the, the first few chapters, are significant to our understanding of who God is, who we are, uh, why there's sin in the world. Um, now, another example I think would be, uh, uh, I would appeal to Charles Hodge, uh, who wrote in the, in the you know, his systematic theology shortly after the publication of The Origin of the Species. So 19th century? 19th century, uh, and there, and in fact his very last book is What is Darwinism? Where he gives a critique of Darwin's theory. And yet, uh, Hodge is very cognizant of uh, given his uh, profound respect of the church fathers, including Augustine, that there's a danger here that we, we impose upon the biblical text certain questions. And he's particularly, uh, while he's very critical of Darwin's theory, he's also very critical of the use of genealogies, Bishop Usher's being the most notable, uh, you know, dating the beginning of the earth at, beginning of the universe at 4004 BC, uh, that and he, and he appeals to the example of Galileo. We, we, we should learn a lesson there, he says, that uh, we uh, read into the text certain assumptions that we made. Uh, and so the problem isn't with the biblical text. It's God's revelation. It's true. The problem lies with our interpretations. 
and those interpretations are shaped by our questions. And so we have to be very careful here. So I think there's a long, right, when we look at it from a historical perspective, um, I think there's a recognition that this is a complex issue in, in that there's complexities in interpretation and in our inferences from the biblical text to, and integrating that with what we find in terms of science. And I'll come to another question in just a minute, but could you highlight why Charles Hodge would be significant to us as evangelicals sure. in the light of his view of scripture yeah. and the like, because the Princetonians, that classic understanding right. of the Princetonians, they were significant to us right. as evangelicals today. Right. I mean, Hodge taught at Princeton for over 50 years, and of course his, the Princetonians and, and Hodge in particular, uh, really are, have, are, well, are widely recognized by historians of evangelicalism, that they really have laid a lot of the foundation for what shapes a lot of evangelical theology today, particularly in our, scripture. Particular view of, of scripture and the issue of inerrancy. Uh, I mean, a lot of that goes back to Hodge and, and Warfield. And, and once again, but even then, there's, there's a, an acknowledgement uh, that, uh, that interpreting scripture can be very difficult. You know, that certain things are simple. The gospel, you know, you know this idea of perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of scripture. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are in scripture fairly clear, like the gospel. But there are other issues, like the issue of origins, um, th that are complicated. And, you know, it's interesting to me that later on with the fundamental, you know, we get the term fundamentalism uh, from the documents, that this essay is called The Fundamentals, that two of the most prominent, uh, two of the essays, and this was written in the early 1900s, around the time of the Scopes trial, that two of the essays, one was written by James Orr, a theologian, and the other one was by George Frederick Wright, on specifically the topic of origins, both of whom argued from more of a theistic evolutionary perspective. And these were people we would consider fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. So the, the- And fundamentalists, some of the doctrines that they were really passionate <laughs> about would be- Like the virgin birth, uh, the reliability of scripture, you know, the inerrancy, yeah. the, the deity of Jesus. And yet they acknowledge, they recognize that this is a difficult issue. So to go back to the original question, I think the, the picture we get in terms of looking at it from a historical perspective is much more complicated than some would allow. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that's not to dissuade us from in having further dialogue and, and wrestling with this issue, but just, it, it acknowledges that there, these are complicated questions. So when we're in conversations at church or a seminary or university, uh, how should this discussion, you're already hinting right. at it, but how should this discussion as it relates to historiography and theology bear upon our conversations yeah on humans as Christians today? Yeah. Well, I've, I've had the opportunity to teach on this in, in several church settings. And one of the things I try to impress upon the class is that, uh, that there are people, good people on all sides of this issue. I mean, I've met people who are very good scholars who, uh, who are young earth creationists. I've met other good scholars who love Jesus and believe, who affirm uh, the inerrancy of scripture who are uh, theistic evolutionists. And I think it's important that we continue a dialogue and, to, and I think there's a need for humility here that these are complex. And also it should tell us that, uh, to go back to Dr. Josberger's point, I think the main point of Genesis 1 and 2 is more about who God is than about how God created. Uh, and then certainly I think we can infer from the, the creation narrative certain important theological truths like the idea of creation, uh, that the the universe is not the result of these uh, purely natural or un unintentional and unpurposeful forces. There's a, there's a divine mind and a divine intention and purpose that, that is behind creation. In fact, Augustine makes a very interesting point. He says, look, God could have created everything instantaneously. The issue here is not, has, has nothing to do with time. The issue here has all to do with why does God, is, is that God creates with purpose and intent. And so we look at the days of creation, for example, especially when you compare it to the ancient, uh, the cosmogenies that, you know, these stories of other stories of creation where there's, it's, it's happenstance and it's conflicts between the various gods. What we see in the creation narrative is a very intentional, very uh, purposeful uh, elaborate a process that the God says, let it be, and it was, it was so. And so I think clearly there, there's a stark contrast between the biblical story of creation and the pagan stories of creation. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Gurney. Mr. Peterson, I was fascinated by how 
Charles Darwin has been received, or how he's been received by many conservative Christians, and by how Darwin's bulldog, quote unquote, Thomas Huxley was instrumental in that negative reception. Could you please tell us the pivotal role Huxley has in shaping the perception of Darwin? Including how ironic it is that Huxley is seen as a principal advocate for Darwinian thought. Yeah, um, one, of, one of the interesting things in these debates, and I think Dr. Gurney has already touched upon it, is that so often the focus is on the theology or the biblical interpretation or the science behind it, that um, the history that has sort of naturalized a lot of our presuppositions about what is or is not the main focus of the debates has often been pushed to one side. And really, um, over the last 50 or years or so, there's kind of been, um, I, I like to call it kind of a quiet revolution in historiography, kind of going back and undoing some of our presuppositions about how the history has, has went. And uh, there was, I'll, I'll get to Huxley, I'm, it's kind of an oblique uh, trajectory here, but uh, Herbert Butterfield, who was a, a historian of science, wrote something, uh, wrote a book called uh, The Whig History of Science, uh, or Against Whig Histories. And what he means by this is the Whigs were a, a British political party, and they had a tendency to narrate history as sort of the inevitable culmination up to them and their own time, so that they would take the little threads of what they thought were the successful avenues of thought and then see them as sort of the necessary leading up to their, their triumphalist party. Um, and so Butterfield essentially turned this into a general historiographical principle, and he says that we can re we really need to fight against this type of, of history because it um, what it does is it really ends up separating things into categories that the actors in history themselves wouldn't have recognized. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about Darwinian evolutionary theory today, I think that this is just a really robust example of how many presuppositions come into play that people don't even often examine. Um, and one uh, would really be that Darwinian evolutionary theory is a necessary antithesis to religious thought or theology or um, it's a kind of naturalism that kind of pushed God to one side. I mean, we, the question, did Darwin kill God, is probably one of the most frequently asked. Um, and at the centenary of the publication of The Origin, so in 1959, The Origin of Species was published in 1859, that's math for me, 100 years. <laughs> that was actually uh, quite good. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was How many really worried I was going to choke on that, but we, we, I, ma I managed to make it through. Um, there was a scholar, a Darwinian scholar, with the very memorable name of Gertrude Himmelfarb, and she wrote uh, how Darwin was essentially, and she was in fact lamenting this a little bit, but that Darwin really represented the culmination of naturalist thought against religion. Um, and that's a really common preconception. So Richard Dawkins is very famous for a quote where he says, uh, Darwin, for the first time in history, allowed one to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Um, and what he meant by that was we didn't need God, like in William Paley's design system, to say, well, God designed all of these little intricacies to be pre-adapted to their environments. Rather, it just happened by nature. We don't need God anymore. And that's Dawkins' view is not atypical. I think that that's the pretty standard view. Um, but as part of this reevaluation uh, in historiography, kind of going back to look at how Darwin and others received him, the story becomes much more complicated, as, as has been pointed out already. And several of the interesting factors is that uh, we, the, the passion that is often circulating around Darwinian theory um, was almost uh, produced like a stage play. Uh, Huxley, to come back to Huxley. Thank in, you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Finally, yes, we're, we made it back. Um, in 1860, at Oxford, Oxford opened a new natural uh, history hall, and they were having a series of lectures and debates. And what happened is Huxley ended up facing off against uh, a bishop named Wilberforce. And this became kind of a famous set piece in the history of the supposed warfare between Christianity and science, and especially with Darwinian theory, because Huxley supposedly bested Wilberforce, who was arguing against evolutionary theory. Um, but what gets lost in the light is that Wilberforce's arguments were not primarily religious. In fact, they were primarily scientific. And Darwin himself pointed out that Wilberforce, when he wrote his review of The Origin of Species, pointed out what Darwin said were, quote, unquote, the most speculative and theoretical bits of it. Um, 
And the, this victory here is often touted as kind of one of the first victories of science over uh, theology or religion. But really, if it is a victory, it's a victory of, of, at the level of history. Um, because the debate wasn't even brought up for another 10 or 20 years. Uh, no one, there's no eyewitness accounts. There, the eyewitness accounts happen quite a bit later and they're always very polemical. Um, and what's overlooked is how much Huxley and uh, a bunch of his friends who formed what was known as the X Club wanted to really rest what uh, we call today methodological naturalism, the idea that one is doing, like, like Dr. Josberg was saying, one does science, but those scientific questions don't necessarily bear immediately on religion and vice versa. One can bracket those when you're looking through a microscope. Um, Huxley and his friends really wanted to wrest that away from theistic uh, science. Because what's very interesting, there was a recent book that was published um, that was comparing Huxley, Thomas Huxley, to uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who's a very famous physicist. At the, they're, they're contemporaries with one another. Um, but Maxwell was a, a theist, and he did what he called theistic science. So, and all of the values that he saw in science were based upon his religious worldview. The idea of um, the uniformity of nature was because God was a lawgiver who covenants with his creation. Uh, the natural limits of science uh, were based upon the, the good borders that God has set and boundaries within his creation. And the interesting th the takeaway of this is that H both Huxley and Maxwell essentially have the same scientific principles. But what Huxley did is he starts creating a history uh, that sort of tries to wrest away this methodological naturalism from the theists and sort of writes it backwards. And so he drives a wedge that makes it seem inevitable and natural that natural scientists were always there, that that is sort of the default position of science, when in fact Darwin himself in the first edition of The Origin of Species has two quotes. One of them is from a guy named William Hewell, who actually coined the term uh, scientist and was himself a believer that says that uh, in, in these pages you will find a demonstration of the good order that God has ordained in creation. Um, and the second quote uh, was from, Francis, or from uh, yeah, Francis Bacon on the two books uh, analogy. So the one book is the book of scripture and the other book is the book of God's creation in nature. And these are two epitaphs uh, to or Darwin's origin of species. And so it can really uh, though there's obviously an immense amount of scientific detail, it is a species of Victorian natural theology that Darwin was doing. But we forget this precisely on a historical level because it keeps getting narrated backwards and these, these intricacies keep getting cut out of the picture and so we end up with someone like Richard Dawkins saying that Darwin was the first to allow one to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist when that simply wasn't the case. Um, Huxley, his own view on natural selection. Yeah, so that's another interesting point, is that Huxley um, is, like you said, called Darwin's bulldog because he was a very prominent advocate uh, for Darwin. But the interesting thing is that the only reason he liked Darwin's theory is because he could co-opt it, essentially, into his own agenda for naturalism. Um, he didn't buy into natural uh, Darwin's mechanism of natural selection, which Huxley, is striking. Which is very striking. Uh, Huxley didn't believe uh, that there was any randomness to creation, and actually, Huxley himself was not against um, religion. He coined the term agnostic. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where we get that. So he he said he didn't know. Um, and before I end my time, the interesting thing too is that we often um, absolutize like you said with the biblical text, our own concerns and we project them onto history. And so when we see arguments about Darwinism, we often, uh, one, we equate Darwinism with evolutionary theory, which simply isn't true. There was uh, precedence for Darwin's theory uh, that preceded him by quite a bit. Um, he, he, Darwin was actually particularly famous for natural selection as a mechanism, which didn't even become famous until the 1940s when Mendelian genetics was combined with it. Um, and it, it became prominent again. Um, but Huxley was advocating for a social status shift to scientists. In, in the Victorian era, the priests were still considered um, essentially the intellectual elite. They were the public intellectuals of the day. And so by resting uh, naturalism and by advocating for Darwinism, this isn't uh, against religion so much as it is for Huxley and his friend's own position in that society. And part of the fallout that happens is we see 
design arguments kind of fade away. Now, that was for a bunch of reasons. That wasn't just because of Darwin, but we, again, tend to absolutize that as, oh, God and design kind of gave away to godless evolution. But design theory, and this will seem strange to us, was very intricately tied into how social order was thought to be structured in the Victorian era. Um, the idea of the French Revolution was still fresh in everyone's mind, so the, uh, that there would, would be no God or that social order would somehow not be intricately designed was seen as uh, essentially leading to chaos. And so what Huxley and others were trying to do by pushing against design was not just design itself, but they were actually trying to advocate for a different social order. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the ultimate takeaway is just history really makes things much, much more complicated. And our bi the binaries that we trade in today, just th that's just simply not the case at all. Those who control the historical terms of debate control the debate. And I think with the biblical text, with theology, mm -hmm. it's the matter of the presuppositions we bring to the discussion really influence the shape. And regardless of where people stand on creation and evolution on the various views. I think that humility piece that we were talking about earlier is so key that it would hopefully open up a conversation of inquisitiveness, mm -hmm. not inquisitional um, uh, approaches to one another. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Dr. Gull, uh, what, while certainly it is the case that metaphysics, philosophy, and theology play a role in how people approach science, we just heard about Maxwell, uh, how do you as a scientist deal simply with the subject matter of biology without having to get locked in to debates over creation and evolution? And then I'll follow up with a few other questions. Um, I think for me, part of, it, part of it comes down to the structure of science and the definition of science. And one of the things that, um, as a scientist, we define science as being um, the study of the naturalistic causes and naturalistic effects of what's going on in the universe and the world and life and things like that. It doesn't say there's not a supernaturalistic side or realm, but that science studies the naturalistic side. And so in a lot of cases with scientists, especially scientists of faith, you end up sort of doing this divide, um, as was mentioned. You know, I, I do my science, I look at the naturalistic stuff, I, kind of put the, the whole idea of God over on the side. And I would say a lot of, a lot of believing scientists do that, um, just because you sort of end up in these two worlds. One that says there may be a supernatural, but it doesn't interact with the world around us, and so it's not a valid area of study. And another side that says, the theistic side that says, but if God created everything, there's, um, the two have to overlap. So I think for a lot of people, it tends to become the two separate um, worlds idea. And um, Stephen Jay Gould called this the non-overlapping mm -hmm. magisteria. Mm -hmm. um, I think an interesting way, though, to look at it is if you take the assumption, though, that God is not just out there, he didn't just create and step back, if he does interact with the world, and this, again, is getting into the idea of presuppositions, if God does interact with the world we have, then there is an interaction between supernatural and natural. And so that opens up a different side of the question. And so you end up with people mm -hmm. looking at how do we integrate the two. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes kind of a, a, an interesting question of, of how do we interact with these. And I, one thing I found to be very useful is to realize that in both cases, on the side of faith and on the side of science, we're looking for the idea of truth. What's going on? It, it's the same question. We're looking at it maybe in different ways, but in both cases, we're looking to see what's really going on there. And the second thing I found very helpful is to realize that both the field of science and the field of theology and faith understand that there's more to reality than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. And that in both cases, we, we assume there's more to our reality than what's out there. Um, as a scientist, I assume there's atoms in the table here, and there's you know molecules zipping around my cells, and there's quarks and all these other things. As a Christian, I also assume that there is a supernatural influence that is going on, that is sustaining the world, that has designed it to be the way it is. And so I think that's one touch point that the Christian scientist can, um, can look at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, 
Moreover, for you as a biologist, what are the most important questions that you ask of your subject matter methodologically? Um, within the constraints of only looking at the naturalistic side, I think there is, um, as far as science goes, I think there's looking for that idea of repeatability, control, and things like that, having good science that is repeatable. Um, however, not when we look at the origins issues, we have to understand that's not an experimental discipline. We can't go out, we can't set this up in a lab. People tried, um, but we can't look at it over the timeline of four and a half billion years. There's, there's just no way we can do that. And so I think the biggest thing there is the idea of trying to form a coherent story out of the data we have. And I think one misconception a lot of people have about scientific data is that we see, we assume that data are um, objective and that well, the data show this and there's one, in one interpretation that's correct. But as other people have mentioned, the, the role of presuppositions also plays into the scientist. And I think scientists have a reputation for trying to be objective, but our own presuppositions come in as well. And so my presuppositions, my paradigm of how I think the world works is going to affect how I read the data and what interpretation I draw out of it, what data I think are convincing, and what data I think are anomalies that can be excluded or kind of pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. And so I think the whole question is how to make a coherent story, but my presuppositions are also going to affect what story I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. Now with that, last question is how important is humility in a conversation on scientific method? And I think we've been getting at the theme of humility in different ways. What, what more would you wish to add in this regard? Well, one of the things with science is that since we're constantly testing and we can only look at one particular instance, there's always the possibility that there's another instance out there that goes against what I have seen in my conclusions. Um, I can't test every possible apple out there to show that it actually tastes like an apple or acts like an apple or whatever. There may be an apple that doesn't fall in that pattern. And so you always have to have that humility that somebody else may get closer to the truth through a different method, through a different set of experiments. Um, and so there's always that question of, am I looking at it correctly? I may not agree with the way somebody else is looking at it, but what can I learn from them? How can we try to bring those in? Mm -hmm. And we talk about the scientific community and the need for collaboration and things like that. And there are certainly is a need for um, collaboration, but I think one of the things that we also don't see in the scientific world that the public doesn't see is how many divisions and how much conflict there is between competing paradigms. And um, there's a lot that we need to learn to be able to step outside of our own paradigms, our own assumptions of how molecules interact to maybe learn, oh, there might be another way it could work. But that's so hard to do to step out of well, it just reminds me of a debate that's gone on for some time between E.O. Wilson and Richard Dawkins on kin selection and gene selection. And someone was asking Wilson about, and they're both leading evolutionary thinkers, uh, one at Harvard, one at Oxford. And someone asked in an interview with E.O. Wilson uh, about his debate with Richard Dawkins, because it was quite heated. He said, uh, I don't have a debate with Richard Dawkins. I only debate scientists, he's a journalist. And so it's like, <laughs> that's quite scathing, regardless of what you think about Wilson and Dawkins, but you know, how much real humility is in that conversation? And they do have these strong differences in the midst of some overlapping similarities. So it's just, it's, it's striking to me, the kind of rows that go on. To paraphrase an administrator I used to, I worked with years ago, um, one of the things we have to remember is that scientists are sort of like people. <laughs> in that, we, we do have all of those emotions. We have those that, you know, that competitiveness. We have that desire to be right. Um, to, we want to figure things out. Um, but it also brings out a lot of, um, a lot of pride and a lot of um, 
other emotions that, again, we see scientists as being the, the clinical objective, you know, I don't put my emotions into it, but we're sort of like people. Mm -hmm. We never see that among theologians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. we, we dealt with that Scholars. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Moving right along. Uh, so, uh, Pastor Nicholas, uh, as someone with science degrees who's also a pastor, how do you deal with these questions with congregants who come to you to ask about them? Yeah, probably something interesting and even unique about my position in that as I started, uh, before I was a believer, I was an, a working engineer with a master's degree in geotechnical engineering and environmental engineering. So I, I handled core samples from deep below the earth and I saw the fossils and I saw the things that are below the earth and so I had a full acceptance of the kinds of evolutionary and old age of earth uh, theories that there was. And so when I became a person of faith, those didn't immediately challenge me. What was challenging to me wasn't did those things exist or, or were they right? Uh, sin challenged me. And I don't think science is going to keep anybody from Jesus. Sin is going to keep people from Jesus. Uh, it, was, it, it allowed me, though, to ask questions. I did, and I continued to ask those questions, and I just didn't feel, I feel like I was at odds with those questions. What happens um, often for me is a student will come home from college where they were given a, a dose of why you shouldn't believe. And they're like, you know, I think I heard a, a quote one time that I don't remember who to attribute it to, but he said, uh, I don't believe in God anymore, but I miss him. And a lot of times what happens is students come back and that's where they're at. And they're saying, I can't believe anymore. And I say, why don't you believe anymore? And a lot of times it'll come to this, this just it's one or the other, it's this or it's that. And, and my response will be, well, let's make sure we, we understand what it really says. I love the responses I've heard already because that's where I go. Like, have some humility, be willing to say, uh, this is a point of discovery. Don't throw God out because you're discovering something that's at odds with something you believed. Did you believe something that was there or not? Was it really in the Bible? Was it really in science? Why don't you be inquisitive? Why don't you open with it in a humble way, just in your humility and say what's out there? And I'll usually include things like, as we've heard here, there's lots of answers to these questions that fit right within the pale of orthodoxy. There's lots of ways to understand how did the Genesis story work? I'm more concerned about the Genesis 3 story. You know, yeah. <laughs> you will be as God. Don't worry about what God said. Just ignore him and do what you want to do. That's where I am more concerned because that's sometimes where this kind of challenge to their faith leads. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, I don't find the science question to be particularly challenging, especially because most of the students asking their questions don't have higher level degrees. They haven't been through a lot of the history. They heard one professor who's got a, a, a particular viewpoint that's really drummed something into them. So with, with humility, with a willingness to listen, with a willingness to see scripture from all it could be, uh, and and not to be so dogmatic about it, you, so you end you have, up with a much better place. So when you have congregants who might even be polar opposites on an issue, oh, and it get pretty intense, how do you try and navigate those between we, we, congregants? I would say I have a very I, I'm part of a very diverse church. We have people that are every political spectrum, every philosophical perspective, uh, different ages, different ethnicities. We got it all, and so it's not unusual to to find tension in that. I think tension is a place of discovery, and um, I love it. Tension is a place. Yeah, and I'll go and I'll go and I'll go to that discovery with either side, with someone who is a, a new earth creationist who's offended that somebody would actually see a place for evolution and and so I'll ask different questions. Like one of my favorite questions is when did death come into the world? And I'll say, What did God mean you will die? And because if and understand it from the perspective of what was living and what wasn't living at the time and just for the point of making them think. Just saying, open up a little bit. Think think through this a little bit more. And don't be afraid of answers, because the way that God worked with me, when I mm -hmm. trusted him, mm -hmm. he got inside of me and he started saying, you believe this about yourself, mm -hmm. but that's not true. And in the discovery, I discovered what God thought about it. And it was a, that tension created an opportunity to discover who God could be. I don't see that any difference in looking at science or looking at creation or looking at those things. And I, I invite people to greater discovery to learn about what God has to say, both in the Word, and be open to what scientists say. They put time and effort into this, and there are limits to it, but there's really cool things you can discover from it. Mm, thank you. And then how do you foster, further to this, inquisitiveness and humility on scientific subjects while also cultivating confidence in Christian scripture? 
Yeah. Well, I, a, a lot of folks have already addressed this issue. I don't see the conflict. Uh, I asked them, <laughs> specifically show me where the conflict is, and we'll address that. Is this really biblically what it says? Um, is, is this going to create a yes or a no for you? And is there an answer here? Sometimes, I mean, someone said it before, uh, a, a um, seven-day creation is coherent. God who can, who can do what he wants to do can do that. And I have no problem with that. And I ask the person who's, who's against that to at least make, make room for the fact that that's coherent. And so I go to the same person who says, well, this is all I believe. And I'd say, but can we talk about things like how long was a day? Yeah. You know, and, and did they make sense before there was even uh, a, a, an earth revolving around a sun? When, when does that start to make sense? And, and I'll propose also uh, other ideas that may be a little bit wilder than that and create more imagination. <laughs> but what would be one? Just what would be one? Okay. So maybe when Moses was in the cleft of the rock and God showed him where he'd been and all he had done before, he showed him the first day of creation, and it was amazing, and it was a full day of like, I mean, this is like um, virtual reality times 10, and he's watching this thing, and God's showing it all to him. And then at the end of the day, it was the end of the day, and he slept. And there was night, and there was day, and there was another day. And then he gave him the next day of creation, and he showed him all of this, and it was all very coherent with regard to what creation is. And it's all done, and he's sitting there stunned after all of these days. He's thinking, how am I going to write this? <laughs> and he determines the best way to say that to a group of people that didn't get to stand there and watch through the virtual reality all that God had done. I know that sounds, <laughs> it takes imagination, but I want to go with it. People say, give more room to this. Another one, Jesus walked into a room and after his resurrection, how did he get there? We were thrown out of a garden that we can't get back into. What is this place that we're trying to compare to history and evolution? Is it even possible? Is it even required of us to make sense of those two things as though they exist even in the same place? Mm. And I think if you start to room, give room for that, is, is the Genesis story parabolic? Is it not? I, you have to make room for it so that you can make room for all the information God giving you. Live in the tension of it. Be okay with answering. Don't be afraid. I think the thing that worries me the most is when people are so afraid of the answer that they think it's gonna destroy their faith. Yeah, yeah that was, right? if I could interrupt for a sec, that was exactly where I was gonna go. I, I hear all of that behind what you're saying. How do you, without charging at someone and saying, do you recognize you're just afraid? <laughs> I don't say them it. in the classroom and not the pulpit. <laughs> how do you help them to see that there's safety in these questions when it can feel like uh, if any, Thing is uncertain, then they lose the whole Bible, they lose their whole faith, they lose, they lose God, yeah. um, which isn't the case, but do they even recognize that that's the thing? Actually, Becky, that is where the conversation that's usually goes, and it's yeah. been very satisfying so, so far. I've not found that that conversation ends with people saying, uh, or I, I just, I won't believe anymore, or I won't look anymore. I generally <laughs> yeah. find that there is humility. Mm -hmm. People are asking questions because they're confused. They want an answer. Mm -hmm. And and if they get an answer that satisfies it, let them to lock in. Mm -hmm. But when that becomes unsatisfactory, again, the tension creates an opportunity for them. And I think that more often than not, I see people of faith saying, thank you, that helps me. Well, I can I, move yeah. in that. I can move in that. And to add to that, I think it's really important that we wherever our role is, create a space where they can ask the question so that they mm. find out that there is safety. This would probably be my, be my critique of sometimes what we do in the church. And, and we've all run into it, maybe we've even done it before, where we have such a dogmatic answer ourselves that we, we're the ones who influence the idea that if I lose this pillar, I've lost my faith. And I'd say that's, that's a greater Amen. concern of mine, that we've actually fed this Amen. in the way that we have walked through the issues that we claim are, they're non-negotiables. And I would say we've got to just get rid of that. Be humble and be open to yeah. what God really do. It's kind of cool. Yeah. If I can interject, I think from hearing from you, and I think this has been raised several times, I think there's an underlying, and here's the from my, my philosopher's hat, there's a logical error I think that's involved here. And that the logical error is that it's either creation or evolution. There, in other words, if, one, if you have one, then you can't have the other. And... And when I hear that, I, and I have students that bring that up to me, I point out to them, even among young earth creationists, and as a former young earth creationist, I, who had the opportunity to actually take seminars from Henry Morris and some of the leading young earth creationists, uh, even they would acknowledge that there is what we call microevolution. That's, that's their term, microevolution. So, so the question is not whether there's evolution. The question is, 
how much can evolution explain? And once you get away from this kind of false disjunctive, you know, it's either creation or evolution, once you get away from that, then I think that opens up the possibilities of inquiry. And then you can say, okay, so let's hear, especially since our expectation is that God's truth, you know, is, is all truth. In other words, if it's true, then it's God's truth. So regardless of where the source of that truth is, so we want to be willing to listen uh, to what the scientists are saying from their various perspectives. Certainly, we want to recognize they have presuppositions. Uh, maybe some of them are, are um, uh, grounded in a certain naturalistic commitments, and we want to take that into consideration. But that doesn't necessarily mean what they see is false. And so we have to really, and, and once again, that, but then we have to do that, we have to allow for dialogue. And I think that's the problem is we've created is either or that cuts off any possibility of dialogue and any possibility of humility. Mm -hmm. And we create these kind of what I call fortress mentality. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's either, you know, fortress creation or it's fortress evolution. But like I said, even young earth creationists, uh, I, I don't know of a single young earth creationist that denies microevolution. So if they're willing to concede there is some evolution, then you have to, that, that, that metaphor, these two fortresses fails. Mm -hmm. Another thing I've seen, I believe is a quote from Alvin Plantica, and he talked about the conflict we bring up in the church between the theistic evolutionists or the old earth creationists and the young earth creationists. And we're very quick to say one must be right and one must be wrong. Yeah. And one of the things he, remind, he reminds us of is the fact that if we believe that there is a God who created that we need to remember we're on the same side. Yeah. We might disagree mm -hmm. with the details, mm -hmm. but we should not, as the church, be shooting down the other side who has the same fundamental belief. And so neither should we be shooting them down, neither should we stand by and watch them be shoot down. Right. Mm -hmm. We want to engage their yes. arguments, we want to look at their evidence. But we need to recognize that we're on the same side. Right. And if we can, and, and if we, we could start really in whatever our spheres of influence, help the conversation move more in the direction not to shoot one another down, not to stand on the side and watch one another get shot down, uh, that would be so important if we could get there. And, and what, what might we do? What might others do so that have the robust discussions, have the dialogue, have the debate as long as it's civil and gracious and ironic? But how do we get there? What would you, as final thoughts, encourage even the viewers, how we might get there together? From a pastoral perspective, I say there, there's three things. Is this the result of sin? People want to be God. They don't want God to be God. So mm -hmm. part of it is I just don't, I will not, you know, and then, then there's really not an open discussion. And, and, you know, and you've got to call it out and hope that that would, that would be adjusted. The second one is the fear question. I'm afraid of the answer. And that takes a different kind of response, you know, response from the pastor. It's like to encourage them, you know, to find that. And the other one is it's an obstacle. Someone who who's genuinely wanting to figure this out and saying this is an obstacle to me, they tend to be the most open to talking about mm -hmm. something like this, and they're not fearful. I would say to you that I primarily run into that, the obstacle, um, among people in the church. They just, it's an obstacle, and they're trying to figure out how do I overcome this obstacle because they heard something dogmatic, and they've started to depart, and they feel shamed or concerned or, you know, I don't, how do I make this work? Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I found in class, and it's it was an accident. I mean, I have all my arguments that I bring, and I think they're really effective. And then sometimes I'll say something that I didn't think was particularly great, but the students respond well. Um, and that is to address both the fear of losing God and the fear of being wrong in the same setting and remind them that while it sometimes the church forces this into a salvific issue which grieves my heart but that we can agree to set it aside from the salvation issue and then it becomes a safer question to ask and i'll simply ask my students i'll take a i'll take an example outside of the creation discussion um you know baptism if it has to be theological or something completely random are you more saved when you know the answer to this math equation than when you don't? Mm -hmm. Or are you more saved when you walk out of my classroom at the end of a semester knowing all the things I taught you than you were when you walked in? Amen. No. You may have grown, you may have explored, you'll continue to grow, you'll change your position on things, but that doesn't affect your salvation. It may hopefully prompt a deeper relationship with God, 
if you understand him better, but removing again the fear from losing God and the fear of being wrong Mm -hmm. as if it's something to be ashamed of or that affects your standing before God. I, I tell them all the time, when we get to heaven, half I'm going to find out that half of what I taught them in class is wrong, and I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just, just, just half. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm working toward. That's what I'm working toward. I, yeah. And and it's it's safe. I let them see that part of the journey. So again, reframing and safety, addressing the fears, putting the conversation in its proper place. I think for me, one of the things that I try to bring out in my students is the idea of people who have, that people who have different opinions and different conclusions on an issue have reasons for it. Mm-hmm. And it's not just an ignorance, um, a matter of ignorance or something like that. That if you can look at what the presuppositions are and what the reasons are, that there, there is a logic to it and that somebody can end up with a coherent, mm-hmm. logical framework that is different than mine. And so, um, as one of my, as we were talking about evolution in class this semester, I said, you know, if you take God out of the picture and assume he doesn't interact, all you're left with is a naturalistic evolution. That's the only explanation you can have. And one of my students said, oh, it makes sense then. (laughs) Well, yeah, it doesn't make sense for me as a Christian who believes that God does interact. And so trying to figure out where those presuppositions are and what would lead somebody to logically conclude in a way that is different than me, I think will help kind of peel back. And what also you can learn from that. What I, what I can learn from that, but also to help uncover what my presuppositions are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so why my idea doesn't necessarily look as logical to somebody else. Yeah, so not just theological presuppositions, biblical presuppositions, historical presuppositions, my own personal presuppositions, Mm -hmm. sometimes tainted by sin, all the more needed, uh, this matter of humility and charity. What am I gaining from this conversation? What am I missing? What can I learn from others? So that we continue to promote this God who is so profoundly revealed in Scripture but also concern for one another Mm. and the creation at large. That inquisitiveness rather than an inquisitional posture Mm. is what's so needed in our church and in our society today. As we conclude, I just want to thank our panelists for all that they had to share today. I'm just really grateful. I've been grateful for the partnership we've had at Multnomah Seminary with the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, with the seminary grant, uh, Science for Seminary grant, and how we've been about this Church and Science Partners for the Common Good theme throughout this uh, three-year initiative. And I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of New Wine, New Wineskins. Again, many thanks to all of you, and we look forward to continuing the conversation.